Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's webinar, where we're going to be discussing basics of the right to know law. My name is George Spies with the Pennsylvania Office of Open Records, and uh, it's really good to see so many people signed up here this morning and online. Uh, before I begin the presentation, I have a uh, public service announcement. Uh, for any of you who are involved in the appeal process, which, hey, we're going to be talking about uh, during this presentation towards the end, <coughs> pardon me, but um, uh, our office has uh, been working on and is preparing to roll out uh, some new functionality with our website and docketing system for those of you who either file appeals or uh, on the agency side who are responsible for responding to appeals. Um, what you'll be able to do through an online portal is uh, we'll issue you a password and you can log in and see all the documents relative to your appeal submittal or you know appeal responses and the like. Uh, it's pretty slick. It's going to be uh, very similar to what you see with uh, other court systems, and it will just give you access automatically. You won't have to, there, there won't be a bunch of uh, emails going back and forth. Um, there won't be uh, the need to contact an appeals officer to ask for copies of what's been submitted. Everything will be right there online with the appeals officer has in their case file you'll have automatic access to. Uh, that's going to be rolled out uh, July 31st, so it's right around the corner. And uh, we would uh, encourage you when that's rolled out, uh, take a look at it. I believe there's going to be uh, some training available on it as well. So um, uh, yeah, uh, look forward to uh, seeing it out there and hopefully, you know, give us your feedback on, uh, you know, what you think is working, what uh, improvements you might like to see and so forth. Uh, but uh, looking forward to the new uh, online uh, docketing system and the uh, portal for e-filing. Okay, let's talk about the basics of the right to know law this morning. And I want to begin, well, yeah, there's uh, some other preliminaries I should uh, get out of the way first. Um, if you've never participated in one of these sessions, it's essentially a PowerPoint presentation with me talking. Uh, the uh, PowerPoints are available on our website. Go to the training tab, scroll down, and you'll see all of the PowerPoints that we use for these training sessions. You are more than welcome to download them. Um, you know, maybe you have a colleague who couldn't make it this morning. Maybe you're conducting training uh, locally and you need some resources, um, or maybe you just would find it helpful for your own future reference. Uh, feel free to download them and uh, use them as you see fit. Also, this session is being recorded. And it takes a couple days, but once the session has concluded, the recordings uh, get posted to our YouTube channel. And then there's typically a link on the website to the YouTube channel for this particular recording. Uh, like I said, that usually takes a couple days because of the file size and just our administrative staff is, has more work than they know what to do with. So uh, the same, same conditions apply though. If uh, you want to download that for your own reference uh, for a colleague who may not be available this morning, uh, feel free to do so. Uh, we view them as public records, so there's no limitations on what you want to download or, or how you want to use them. <coughs> um, so this morning's topic is basics of the right to know law. If you have questions during the session, you can type them in using the chat feature on your screen with Teams. Uh, I will do my best to answer the questions live as we're proceeding. Uh, however, I have two conditions. First is that we're talking about the right to know law. So let's stay on topic and uh, keep your questions you know, uh, uh, related to that. The other thing is that I would ask you try to keep your questions as succinct and as brief as possible. And this is for practical reasons. Sometimes folks will type in several paragraphs. And it, it's honestly, it's just awkward for me to sit here and read through it with everyone else waiting patiently. So 
if you have you know an unusually complex situation or something that is unique to your particular set of circumstances you know we'll do one of two things we'll wait until the end of the presentation and i'll come back to it and answer it for the good of the order or i'll ask that we take the conversation offline and you know right now on the screen there's the phone number for the office as well as the url address for our website where you'll find email accounts that you can submit your questions what happens is that our administrative staff uh, will be the first responders and they're pretty good at getting you steered in the right direction if uh, we need some higher level expertise they'll escalate your request to senior management and they usually get back to you within 24 hours. Uh, and you know they can uh, make sure that your questions get answered. <clears throat> now, we can't write requests for you. We can't respond to requests for you. And we can't really discuss the, sub the substantive issues regarding any active appeals, but we can pretty much get you steered in the right direction. Okay, so there's all the preliminaries the public service announcements whatever and um, now let's talk about the uh, the right to know law and i like to begin these presentations with a fundamental statement um let me get over here there we go you know why is the right to know law important well it goes back to access to government records, government transparency, and just basically good government. You know, it's it's the, okay, someone cannot see the screen. I think everyone else seems to be okay. Uh, if you can hear my voice, I'm assuming you can, uh, suggest logging out. Okay, neither can, oh, you know what? Hold on, you are right, I forgot to share. And I apologize. Everyone settle down, give me just a second need to do the share when i was setting this up i skipped this step okay it should be there now someone confirm there you go better 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 yes thank you okay hey thanks for reminding me of that i kind of i must have been doing this in my sleep when i was setting up for the uh, presentation uh, and my apologies. OK, so here we go. <laughs> the purpose of Pennsylvania's right to know law is to give the public access to public records. OK, why is this important? Well, oftentimes you may get a right to know request that isn't as clear as uh, you would prefer. Or, you know, maybe you're new to the process and you're not sure what you should do. My recommendation is always come back to this fundamental statement because it it can get you steered in the right direction. Um, the obligation of the agency is to give the public access to public records, and we're going to talk about that all through this presentation, just what exactly that means. OK, nothing more, nothing less. Occasionally people see that uh, they see that term right to know. And they think it means more than just access to public records. They view it as um, kind of like the government version of Google. And you know, that's just not the case, OK? Uh, it is possible sometimes that people will submit a right to know request that ask a question. You know, a question is not necessarily asking for records, but maybe through answering that question, you identify the records that the person is asking for or truly seeking or maybe you have records that answer that question, well, then you are obligated to provide those records and respond to the request in a positive manner. But, you know, when confused, when in doubt, I recommend coming back to this fundamental statement. The purpose of the law is to give public access to public records. Now, there are some caveats that are very important with the application of this law. <laughs> Your starting point from the agency perspective is that every record you have in your possession is presumed to be public. Okay, that's the starting point. Unless the agency can make a legal and factual case as to why the record 
should not be released into the public domain. It is the agency, not the public, who bears the burden of proving that a record is not public. Now, this sounds rather daunting, and there are you know, uh, numerous cases where someone encounters this law for the first time, uh, or maybe they get their first right to know request, and they think, oh my gosh, you know, everything that we have in the office here is going to end up on the front page of the newspaper tomorrow, or is it's going to end up in, uh, you know, on somebody's Facebook page. And I'm here to tell you that that's not the case, that there are a number of tools built into the right to know law, as well as other laws, that if you get a right to know request and, you know, a red flag goes up and you're thinking, I don't know, it just doesn't seem right that we should release something like this to the public because of the confidentiality or the privacy implications. Chances are the right to know law uh, uh, will provide a tool that allows you to do that. Okay, definition of a record, yeah, you're you're a couple slides ahead of me. Uh, don't drink so much coffee, it'll be okay. Um, <laughs> I'm just joking around here. Pardon my weird sense of humor. Okay, so agencies bear the burden. Now, what's going on here? Here we go. Something else I wanna emphasize is the fact that the right to know law is not a confidentiality law. Okay, what does that mean? Well, first offhand, agencies can give out public records without any interaction with the right to know law itself, okay? Uh, let's say it's, it's budget season and I walk into your office, I request a copy of the budget, and you happen to have a stack of them sitting there. There's nothing in the right to know law that prevents you from simply handing me a copy of the budget, okay? I do not need to file a right to know law request unless you decide that it's necessary in the way you run your open records program. You're gonna discover that the right to know law gives agencies a lot of flexibility in how they manage their programs. Furthermore, you know, you don't have to require that I file a right to know form in order to get those records. I can walk into your office and let's say I have a right to know form for a copy of the budget. You can actually say to me, you know what, George, I have a stack of them right here. If you tear up that right to know request, I'll hand you a copy of the budget. And, you know, why wouldn't I agree to that? Because I'm getting exactly what I want and you're saving yourselves a lot of time and a lot of paperwork, okay? As long as everybody's happy, you can do that. Now, if I say, no, I want to file, I want to follow the right to know process, well, then you have to do it, okay? The law mandates that. But there's nothing preventing you from simply giving out public records without any requirement for right to know requests. As a matter of fact, we consider it a best practice. Use your social media, your websites, Facebook pages, whatever, and post commonly requested public records, budgets, contracts, salary information, purchasing documents, all things that would ultimately be approved through the right to know process. Take a proactive approach and use your social media, use your websites as tools, as business tools. This way, you know, people would much rather sit in the comfort of their family room and surf your website to get the records that they need rather than having to file a right to know request, maybe taking some time off from work, coming down to, uh, you know, Borough Hall or the township office or whatever, uh, and then potentially waiting a month before they get the records that they're seeking. If you take a look at the right to know request that you receive, identify those records that are more uh, commonly requested and proactively put them on your websites, the next time you get a right to know request for one of those records, your response can be, that's on our website, here's the URL for it. And you've, you've met your obligations under the right to know law. Now, a couple things will happen. 
First, you'll notice that the hits on your website start going up, which is a good thing. Okay, that justifies all the work and money that goes into putting up a website. Second, you'll notice that your right to know requests will start going down because those records are already out there in the public domain. And that's going to save you time and work. Okay, so we recommend that. And, you know, if you take a look at our website, we put everything up there, you know, and anything that uh, is relevant or that, you know, gets requested from the Office of Open Records that we have, chances are it's already on our website. Okay, and we'd recommend that you take the time to do that as well. Okay. Now, the agency obligations, what do you have to do in order to comply with the right to know law if you're subject to it? Well, first, and probably most importantly, you have to appoint an agency open records officer, what we call an arrow. These people are also known as right to know officers. It's the same thing. The two terms are interchangeable. Okay. There's no um, limitation on who within the organization can serve as an agency open records officer. It could be the clerk at the front desk. It could be the mayor. It could be a, a council person. It could be your solicitor, uh, anyone who is either a public official or a public employee. You can have more than one arrow. Uh, for instance, you may have a borough where you have one arrow that covers the entire organization. Go three miles down the road to the next borough and they may divide it up. They may have one arrow covering the administrative side and a second arrow covering the police department. That's okay as long as it's clear to the public, hey, who do I give this right to know request to? Okay, that's perfectly acceptable. Um, there's no requirement for training, but obviously we encourage training for right to know officers, uh, you know, like attending this course, okay, is a good thing. Okay, questions popped up. Uh, can a current board member send minutes to a previous board member without a right to know request? Uh, yeah, probably so. I mean, there is an example of what is clearly considered a public record. Okay, meeting minutes. All right. And, you know, my perspective, looking at it from the public's view, is that why should I have to file a right to know request to get a copy of what clearly is a public record? meeting minutes okay that's something that you know probably should be posted online so that i can look at without having to ask anybody so a current board member sending meeting minutes to a previous board member yeah i don't see any problem with that at all okay good question okay now agencies can also come up with their own rules and policies for managing their open records program as long as it doesn't conflict with the law itself any case law associated to the right to know law or any uh, regulations promulgated by the Office of Open Records. I'll give you a quick example. Within the right to know law, there's a clause that says, and I'm paraphrasing here, that you can accept anonymous requests or the law says you may accept anonymous requests. Now, there's another law in Pennsylvania known as the Statutory Construction Act which basically defines what words mean. And because that word may is in there, it also means may not. Okay, so apply a little bit of logic here. That means that the agency can promulgate a policy or procedure that says we will only accept right to no requests where the person is identifying themselves. We will not accept anonymous requests. OK, and there are examples of this all throughout the right to know law where, like I said, it affords agencies a great deal of flexibility in how they manage their programs. Now, agencies can also come up with their own forms and most of them do. Um, OK, I'm going to get to this question in a moment. Um, and they like to have their seals at the top, maybe arrow information, et cetera, et cetera. OK, um, so. You can come up with your own forms, but you must accept the state form, which is on our website. And there's not necessarily anything special about the state form. Um, you know, many agencies will link to it. But if you have a requirement that the request must be on a form in your form, that's fine. 
but it you must accept the state form as well. OK, um, answering the question, that's the next point here. Tell us who your arrows are. On our website, we have a database. Um, let me scroll back here. There's so many questions popping up. I could tell this is going to be a hot bench today, which is fine. Um, OK, so tell us who your arrows are, because on our website, we have a database identifying the arrows throughout the state. For the most part, though, it is a voluntary system, and we realize people move on, they get promoted, they retire, whatever. So one of the takeaways, if you're from an agency today, is check out our website to make sure your arrow records are up to date. This is also the person we reach out to if we get an appeal filed against your agency. So you want to make sure that that is accurate. If not, there is a form that can be filled out and then you email it to us. We verify the information and then we post it to the, uh, uh, the database. This database is publicly accessible. People will contact us. Hey, I can't find out who the arrow is for XYZ Borough. So we'll send them to the database. Uh, and, you know, so it's important that we, we have it up to date. OK, uh, that takes care. What process does the township need to go through to only accept persons identifying themselves? Well, it's a local process. My recommendation is that you have it published in some way uh, so that the public knows what your local processes are. Put it on your website, uh, uh, have it available on your information about the right to know law, about anonymous requests, and you should be OK. Can we require a uniform request form versus just an email that states it's a right to know request? Uh, yes, you can, okay? We have case law where agencies have said we will only accept right to know requests that are on the appropriate form. If you do that, that's acceptable. Now, I'll let you know our office has actually accepted right to know requests on napkins. OK, it's just one of those things. Somebody was kind of testing us and we accepted it. OK, but if you want to require that they use a form legally, you can do that. And I believe there is case law that supports it. OK, next question. Uh, does an agency need to write a formal policy regarding anonymous requests or can it be decided on a case by case basis? OK, I was with you right up until you said case by case. Uh, you do not necessarily need to have a formal written policy, although it's a good thing to have that. It can be an accepted practice. But when you start doing it on a case-by-case -case basis and treat one requester different than another, you might find yourself getting on thin ice there. So I would recommend uh, treat everyone the same, you know, unless there is cause for treating them differently. Uh, usually, you know, that's subjective, but I think you can get yourself, like I said, on thin ice if you start picking and choosing how you're going to treat one requester versus another. OK, uh, let me get back to the screen here and move on. There we go. OK, postings, and this kind of gets back to some of the questions. The right to know re, uh, law requires that you have postings about the right to know law physically within your offices as well as on your website or social media, provided you have a website. OK, it doesn't require that you have a website, but if you do, you need to prominently have posted information about the right to know law. Use this as an opportunity to educate the requester. <laughs> Look at it from the requester's point of view. What do I need to know about this law to successfully get the records that I'm after? OK, well, you need to have contact information for your arrow. How do I, you know, who do I give this right to know request to and how do I get a hold of them? OK, contact information for the applicable appeals office. Now, in 99 percent of the cases, the applicable appeals office is going to be the Pennsylvania Office of Open Records. My recommendation is that you give them our website URL because you can file appeals online 
And like I said, it goes into our docketing system. Everything is electronic in this office. Uh, so the best way to navigate through the Office of Open Records is to go to the website. But if you need to provide them with a blank form in your office so that if they don't have one and you require one, they can get that from you. Same way with your website. You know, they can download a blank form. Uh, and then you need to post any of those recommendations, or I'm sorry, any of those regulations or policies uh, that you may have promulgated, like the anonymous example that I gave you. Again, look at it from the public's perspective. The better they know what the playing field looks like before they enter the game, the easier it's going to be for the agency to interact with them and navigate them through this process. OK, if if they consistently encounter surprises or roadblocks, that's going to be a problem for you. OK, it's going to make your job harder on the agency side. So educate the requester. OK, do you need the physical postings at your buildings or just the main administration building? Uh, usually just the main administration building as a matter of practice, because that's where Technically, the right to know request, typically that's where your arrow is, and that's where most of the public interaction takes place. All right, so I would say the administrative building uh, as, a, as a general practice. Okay, moving on. What can't you do with the uh, right to know law? Well, you cannot limit the number of requests or the number of records that a person uh, ask for within any specified time, excuse me, time frame. For instance, you can't say, ma'am, I'm sorry, you already filed three requests this week. That's all we allow. No, if, if she wants to file a dozen requests in a week's time, the law allows her to do that. Also, you cannot compel a person to tell you why they are filing a right to know request. You can't deny a request based on the reason or what you think the reason is even if it might be just to see you work harder, okay? Now, I'm going to go off script here, and, you know, the, the greater majority of people who file right to no request do it for legitimate reasons. You have a record, the agency has a record that they need for some legitimate business purpose, and they need to file a right to no request in order to get a copy of that record. But there are a handful of people who have weaponized the right to no law, for whatever reason, the relationship between your agency and that person is broken down. You know, maybe they got a traffic ticket. Maybe they thought their water bill was too big. Maybe they just don't like someone on council. OK, so they've decided they're going to be a pain in the neck. And one of the ways they're going to be a pain in the neck is to file a lot of frivolous right to know requests. OK, my experience, you know, I used to be the right to know officer for the Office of Open Records roughly, oh gosh, I think they're on track, 1,500 right to know requests in the coming year, okay? So I've pretty much seen it all. The solution to dealing with problem requesters is on the payment side of the right to know law. And we do a webinar specifically on the payment side, and I would recommend that you uh, attend that webinar. And you, in the same format, you can ask questions or you can call the office and we can talk to you about how you deal with problem requesters, uh, but typically on the payment side. And to wrap this up, basically, it's that legitimate requesters are willing to pay a nominal fee. Um, problem requesters usually aren't willing to pay to be a pain in the neck. All right. And I'll leave it at that. OK, another question has popped up. Uh, can a request be denied if the information is available in a newspaper or a, other public or other publication? Uh, Walt, that's a good question. It's going to come down to whether or not the agency has the requested record in its possession. If it does, it's obligated to provide the record or regardless of where else that record may be. OK, if someone submits a right to know request to that particular agency and that particular agency, number one, determines it's a public record, number two, determines it's in their possession, they have an obligation to provide it in response to the right to know request. Oh, OK, moving on. 
I like to describe the right to know process as an obstacle course. This obstacle course has a start, it has time standards, which are deadlines, and then there are two hurdles on this obstacle course, and in front of the second hurdle, there are three hoops that you need to get through before you can jump over that second and final hurdle. So let's go through this exercise of the obstacle course, and hopefully it will describe the thought processes that an arrow needs to go through. And hopefully if you're here from the public side, you'll be educated as to what an agency needs to look at while they are considering how they're going to respond to your right to know request. Okay, when a right to know request is received by the agency, the arrow immediately needs to note the date as to when they receive the request, okay? Because this is the starting gun. This is when all the deadlines, you know, the clock starts ticking. The first deadline is that the agency has five of their business days in which to provide an initial response to the right to know requests. Um, yeah, alternate arrow, yeah, same form. And that's good. You can, you can have, I should say, you can have more than one arrow, you can have an alternate, which I think is a good thing if the agency is able to do that. Okay, back to the deadlines. Five of the agency's business days. Now it's the agency's business days. And we say that because some agencies are not on a Monday through Friday schedule. Now, if it's like a police department that's 24 seven, it's when is the agency, when is the department available for public interaction for administrative matters? Usually that is Monday through Friday. Um, but then you have some, like, like you go to the northern tier of Pennsylvania, you've got some small townships and boroughs that um, they may only be open two days a week for public business. Okay, that's their business days. Hypothetically, it would be Monday, Tuesday. Then you go to the second week, Monday, Tuesday. Then you go to the third week, Monday. So the close of business on that Monday would be their the end of their five business days. And if you receive a request today, tomorrow will be your first business day. Okay, you don't count the actual day it's received. Okay, so that would be your business days. That's how that's calculated. Okay, and then maintain a copy of the requests. Now the right to know law says you hang on to everything for 30 days until all appeals have been exhausted. <clears throat> and you know, these appeals can go all the way up to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. So you're talking years, all right? But you know, if you have an active appeal, you'll know it, okay? But then there is another law in Pennsylvania. It's called the P Pennsylvania Municipal Records Act. It applies to municipalities, not school districts. Okay, school, what if a school is closed for holiday break, receives while closed? Okay, well, Judy, if the... If the school district's closed, that's not considered a business day. So if there is a holiday break, the first business day would be the first day when the school district is open for business, okay, for public interaction. Okay, and this has happened, okay? This is uh, validated in case law where, um, um, gosh, the case that comes to my mind is uh, Indiana University of Pennsylvania where the same exact thing happened. Someone submitted a right to know request during the winter holiday break, which was like a month, okay? So they had to wait until school came back in session. And that's when the clock started ticking for the right to know request. Okay, um, so the Pennsylvania Municipal Records Act uh, talks about what if I am on vacation? All right, well, again, it, the law says and I'm okay with these questions, folks. These are great questions. It's just be warned, we're gonna run over an hour, guaranteed. Okay, so the law says, and I'm trying to think of the case. It is, um, oh, it's from the Scranton area. I forget the guy's name. Oh, Donahue. Donahue versus the office of the governor, where the same exact thing happened. The arrow was on vacation. The law says the clock starts ticking 
when the arrow receives the request. So the arrow comes back from vacation, that's when the clock starts ticking. Now, I strongly recommend that you have some form of out of office reply for your right to know request so that if the arrow is on vacation, you know, that message lets the requester know when the clock starts ticking so that everybody's on the same page. You know, so that the uh, requester doesn't turn around and file an appeal because they haven't heard anything back from the agency because the arrow's on vacation, all right? So let them know what's going on and what to expect. So like I said, everybody's on the same page. Uh, yeah, another good question. All right, let me get back to the slide. Yeah, the arrow notes the date that they receive the right to know request because the clock starts ticking. The Pennsylvania Municipal Records Act is a law that mandates to municipalities, doesn't apply to school districts, although many school districts follow the act, um, that it, it identifies the retention periods for records that most municipalities uh, touch. And it includes uh, a reference in there to the right to know law where they recommend two years for all right to know law materials. I kind of like that, you know, I think it's it's a reasonable period of time after two years, if you don't have any active appeals related to a right to know request, you know, then you can dispose of those records, get rid of them, uh, recycle, shred them, do whatever you need to do. There's probably no real business need to hold on to those records anymore. So to comply with the Municipal Records Act, I think is probably a good thing. Okay, uh, the office closes at 3.30 p.m. and the form is dropped off at 3.20. The five business days still starts that day, even though there are only 10 minutes. No, no, I, I don't think you heard me earlier that if you receive a, a right to know request at any point today, your first business day would hypothetically be tomorrow. OK, you do not include the current day. There you go, Jamie. All right, moving onward. Extensions. Let's say for whatever reason, or for some specified reasons, that the um, request you cannot provide, the agency cannot provide a final response to the request within the five business days. The right to know law allows the agency to unilaterally invoke a 30 calendar day extension. Note the difference between a business day and a calendar day. A calendar day does include weekends. It does include holidays. It does include uh, um, Christmas breaks, uh, emergency weather closings, and the like. Okay. However, for the extension to be valid, okay, there are some conditions that need to be met. First, you need to invoke the extension within the initial five business day window. Okay, you can't wait into what would be the sixth business day, realize, oh my gosh, I forgot about this right to know request, we'll take an extension. Okay, by default, you have denied the request when it reached the five business day deadline. Legally, it's what we call a deemed denial. Okay, and then you need to notify the requester in writing that you are taking the request. Um, and if the request was submitted by email, well, responding back using email is just fine. You need to provide a reason why you're taking the extension. And Section 902 of the law actually lists six reasons. You choose those that are appropriate. It could be we keep these records off site. It's going to take us longer than five business days to go look through them. Uh, or our solicitor is reviewing the records to make sure we're not giving out anything we're not supposed to, stuff like that. Okay, then you provide a date as to when the requester can expect to get the final response. That's usually on the 30th day of the extension, an estimate of any costs that the requester can expect to incur, and it is just an estimate. It's not a hard quote. Okay, you settle up on the exact amount when it comes time to provide the actual records. So you have the five business days, and then theoretically the 30 calendar days tacked onto the end of it, okay? Um, do not get into the habit of automatically invoking the 30 calendar day extension if you don't need to, 
I mean, there are some records that are readily available and they're clearly public. And if you can get them out, you know, get a response out the door in five business days, that's good. Nothing upsets a requester more than the first communication they get back from the agency is we're taking a 30 calendar day extension. You know, now I realize if the agency is, you know, uh, there's one arrow and they have minimal staffing and that's the best you can do. So you have to take the 30 calendar day extension. Yeah, I mean, that's justified. But there are some agencies that try to throw cold water on the right to know process. Don't do it. OK, it's just it's just bad public service, bad customer service. And if you can avoid doing it as a matter of practice, you should. Uh, minimal staffing. Yeah, uh, you know, the Jeremy, if you need. Oh, hi, Jeremy. If you need to use it, that's what you do. But if you can avoid it, I recommend you try to do everything you can to avoid it. OK, um, moving on. Uh, someone earlier asked, what is a record? Well, this is the first hurdle on the app on the obstacle course. And I recommend that whenever you're trying to understand a law and the right to know law is no exception you know occasionally you're going to find language that is a little vague um maybe it it seems it appears to conflict with something go to the definition section okay and the definition section can a lot of times provide clarity as to what that otherwise vague or conflicting language might be the right to know law, which you can download from our our website, and it's for the most part, it's an understandable common English <laughs> English, and it's not that long of a law. So download it and take a look at it. But look at the definition section and sure enough, it, it defines what a record is. Um, any information, regardless of its physical form or character, that documents a transaction or activity of an agency and is, et cetera, et cetera. OK, so what does this mean? The highlighted phrase documents a transaction or activity of an agency. Well, it means that this record is about what we do. OK, it's related to the mission of the agency. Now, that seems rather obvious, but think about this. There are communications that we generate all day long that may not rise to the definition of a record. Um, I sent an email to one of my colleagues. Hey, I hear about a, a, a new restaurant's opened up downtown. You want to meet for lunch tomorrow? Or what do you think of these trades that the Eagles have been making? You know, how do you think it's going to affect their, uh, their, their chances this fall? Or, you know, I'm picking up a gallon of milk on the way home. Okay, all common communications, but because they don't deal with the agency that I work in, they're not considered records. So I don't need to worry about communications like that being released through the right to know process because they never rise to the definition of a record. They don't make it over the first hurdle, thus they're off the obstacle course. Now, I wanna clarify something. Let's say I'm at home and I'm using my home computer and my Gmail account, and I send a communication to one of my colleagues, say, can you send me the case files on this particular appeal that we're dealing with? Okay, just because it's my home computer and my personal account does not remove it from the right to know process. It's not how the message was created or where the message was stored, but rather it's the content of the message that determines whether or not it's considered a record, okay? And it's up to the arrow to sort that out, okay? And one of the very first court cases related to the right to know law basically says you cannot use private accounts and private devices to hide the public's business. So there's nothing illegal about using personal accounts or personal cell phones or personal computers. It's just beware that you could be generating public records by when you're using your personal devices. OK, we've had a couple questions pop in here. Let me scroll over and take a look at what we got. 
All right. First one is, so what if you never reply to a right to know request? OK, that's considered a deemed denial. If an agency doesn't respond, it is denied by default. OK, and when it's denied, the person, the requester has a right to appeal and we'll get into appeals towards the end of the presentation. OK, but ignoring a request, if an agency does that, is considered a denial. Are there consequences to not responding to one? Well, yeah, at the very first step, the agency has not met its legal obligation. OK, they get a second bite at the apple if they ignore if they if an appeal is filed. OK, but if they ignore the Office of Open Records, which is considered a court at this point, a tribunal, um, then they may be abrogating their right to defend themselves, uh, to meet their legal burden. And if it goes further to a higher level court, and there's, again, there's case law that supports this, there could be monetary sanctions. It just depends on the judge and the discretion that they are allowed to exercise when it gets up to uh, the common pleas court level, okay? There are no automatic sanctions against an agency that ignores right to no requests, but a judge has discretion in determining potential sanctions. But up to that point, the agency has failed to meet its burden, and there's a very good chance that the Office of Open Records would order them to release the records at that point. And if they ignore that, then they could end up finding themselves in contempt. OK. Um, all right. If we ask targets of a right to know if they use their personal devices accounts to discuss a matter and they say no, what obligation do we have to follow up? OK, <clears throat> it's the agency's burden to conduct a good faith search for all appropriate for all responsive records. If you have a public official, let's say, that you ask them to provide any um, responsive records and they balk at that, it becomes an issue. Well, what will happen is that during the appeal, the more than likely, the Office of Open Records will rule against the agency and order them to produce the records. OK, and if they fail to do that because of a public official, the agency is obligated to take legal action against that public official. If it goes further than that, if the public official uh, balks at the legal action or if the agency fails to do so, the requester can take legal steps to find either the agency or that public official in contempt. And obviously, if that happens, there would be legal sanctions available against those parties. But it's essentially up to the requester to follow through on that, okay? But public officials can and have found themselves in legal hot water if they blow off the right to know process. OK. All right. Moving on to further questions. Can you deny right to know request that an individual uses it for fishing for a political campaign? It's going to depend on the specific circumstances. OK, you, again, we go back to that fundamental statement. You cannot deny a request based on the reason or what you think the reason is. It has to be neutral in the way you are looking at it. OK, uh, you're welcome. All right, another question's popped up here. We often get requests from agencies doing environmental development preliminary work for projects. OK. Any suggestions on these types of voluminous requests? Yeah, answer them. Um, you know, it is a valid request. It's a request for records that you have in your possession. My recommendation is do your best to work with these environmental agencies that basically are, are doing their job because the state requires they do it. Or it may be that your very township or borough 
requires <clears throat> an environmental site review. So the new owner goes out and hires a firm to do what you're telling them to do. They turn around and file a right to know request for records that you have. Okay, so why are you giving them a hard time? Because they're doing what you've required the new owner to do. All right, yeah, it's, it's voluminous, it's hard work, but think about it. And in, at the end of the day, your agency profits from the real estate transfer tax that is put on the new owner. Okay. And, you know, I'm sorry to go into this and I hate to sound like I'm preaching, but, you know, I've been doing this for 10 years. Um, so my recommendation is develop a working relationship with these environmental firms because they're doing what the state or your municipality requires them to do. They're working just like you are. Okay. And, and they're legitimate requests. Okay. They're not nuisance requests. All right. Another question has popped up here. Must you obtain a right to know request if the requester only wants an in-person inspection of the records? Again, that's up to the agency. If the agency requires a right to know request, then the requester must provide one, even if all they want to do is inspect the records. Okay. That's a legitimate requirement. We want to provide all documents we legally can that are public, but is there anything that can be done with vexatious requesters? Yeah, Jeremy, uh, like I was saying earlier, you've got the payment side of the right to know law. You are also using a term that is popular right now with the legislator, vexatious requester. Uh, there is uh, at least one bill floating around the legislature that would deal with vexatious requesters. I would recommend uh, contacting your legislator to let them know that you're in support of something like this. Uh, but but take a look at the language. Uh, you know, uh, we have some concerns about it here at the Office of Open Records, but overall we support the concept uh, that would limit um, problem requesters or what, what are defined as vexatious requesters. Okay, but it, it's out there. And uh, at one of these days, the legislature may actually uh, uh, pass that legislation, but it remains to be seen. Okay, more good questions, folks. Like I said, keep them coming. Yeah, I know, I know, it's hard some days. Um, okay, so that's the first hurdle, guys, in identifying what a record is. Okay, now um, we come up to the second hurdle and we have to answer the question, is it a public record? Okay, note the distinction. But before we can make it over the second hurdle, we've got these three hoops we need to jump through or yeah, to, to make it through. So we have some other questions that need to be answered. The first is, do any exemptions apply? And if so, are we going to invoke them? OK, what's an exemption? Well, you go to section, <clears throat> pardon me, 708B of the right to know law, and there is a listing of 30 definitions known as exemptions. These are a couple paragraphs that define a type of record that if the agency wants to withhold from the public, they can. Okay, for instance, and they cover an incredibly broad spectrum of records. For instance, um, there's an exemption that says if by releasing this record we would put somebody in harm's way we can withhold it uh any record that might um, um harm our computer system if we released it we can withhold it any record related to a minor okay we can withhold it anything that would give out personal sensitive information we can withhold it um Anything that, uh, for instance, we, we, we can't give out the home address of a police officer, um, uh, school records and the like, okay? All that is covered by these exemptions, okay? But I should say, exemptions are discretionary. The right to know law does not say you must withhold these. Remember, it's not a confidentiality law, but it says you can withhold these. So that's the first question that we have to answer. Is there an exemption that covers these records that are being requested? And if there is an exemption, are we choosing to invoke it? Okay, 
Then we come up to the second hoop and we have to answer the question, are there any federal or state statutes or a judge's order that make these records non-public? And you would be amazed at the number of laws that are out there. And what you're faced with is that even though the right to know law might say you can release these records, usually these other laws do not give you that discretion. They say you cannot, cannot, not may not, but cannot release these records. Okay. Um, and we actually have another webinar. It's called uh, Laws That Protect Information. And we go into the details. I'll just give you a very quick example. Uh, there is a law in Pennsylvania called CREA, the Criminal History Records Information Act. Uh, let's say that your police department keeps a file on criminal intelligence information. Okay, now there's nothing in the right to know law that covers criminal intelligence. But in CREA, it says, you can only share criminal intelligence information with other law enforcement agencies. You cannot release it to the public. Okay, so that law supersedes the right to know law. If there is any other law that says a record is confidential, that trumps the right to know law. And the agency in denying access to that record cites the appropriate confidentiality provisions of that federal or state statute or judge's order that says you may not release this information. That's how you meet your legal burden, okay, for determining that the record should not be released in response to the right to know request. Okay, is the record protected by privilege? That's the next hoop that we have to jump through. And this typically applies to attorney client privilege. Uh, any record, well, actually any exchange of sensitive information between an attorney and their client is protected by attorney client privilege, which is part of the rules of evidence in Pennsylvania and it's supported by statute. It's also referenced in the right to know law in section 305. For our purposes, usually you're talking about um, the legal advice that a solicitor provides to a mayor, a council, senior management, or whatever. Okay, that communication, that sensitive information between a solicitor and their client agency is protected under attorney-client privilege and cannot be released out into the public domain. Okay, so we've got these three hoops. Are there any exemptions? And if so, are we going to invoke them? Are there any laws that make these records confidential? And is it protected by attorney-client privilege? If not, then and only then can we jump over the second hurdle. And at that point, we're saying it is a public record and it can be released into the public domain. Okay. Now, let's briefly talk about payment issues. Okay. First off hand, the agency is only required to provide the record in its current medium. Okay, this is paraphrasing section 701. What does this mean? Well, it's hard copy versus electronic. So if someone submits a right to know request and they say they want the response, they want the records sent to them in electronic medium, and the agency only has them in hard copy, the agency can reply back and say, we only have them in hard copy. We're more than happy to provide them to you, but you have to pay a fee for the hard copy records. The agency is not required to, um, the agency is not required to scan the records in because that would be converting the records from hard copy medium to electronic medium in reading section 701, only required to provide them in the current medium in which they exist. Okay, now you cannot charge for electronic records. Okay, you can only charge for hard copy. On our website, you'll find the fee schedule. It's essentially up to 25 cents a page, single-sided black and white, eight and a half by 11, eight and a half by 14. Um, a person is allowed, a requester is allowed to 
request to inspect records where they come into the office and look at the actual files. OK, however, the agency is in the driver's seat. The agency determines when during normal business hours it's convenient for this person to come in. The agency can supervise the inspection to make sure that no records are stolen, altered or destroyed in any way. OK, but if the person uh, pulls out a cell phone camera and takes a picture during the inspection, they're allowed to do that. They can make their own copies. OK, now an agency cannot charge for labor. They cannot charge for any redaction. Redaction is where you're giving the person the record, but you have to black out a sensitive piece of information like a social security number, and you can't charge for any legal review. Okay, that's just considered the cost of doing business. You can charge for actual costs like um, uh, postage or whatever. Okay, that's considered a pass-through cost. So if you can document the actual cost, then you can add that onto the invoice for the requester. OK, question has popped up here. <clears throat> is there if there is a vexatious requester, can they be required to pay for a hard copy but provide the hard copy to others for free? Walt, I would recommend against that. You need to treat everybody the same. Uh, you can't just unilaterally decide because I don't like you, I'm going to charge you. And because I do like you, you get it for free. OK, you can kind of see the logic there. That's going to be problematic. And if a requester has a dispute over fees that are charged, they can file an appeal, okay, to our office, and it will be dealt with accordingly. All right, moving on. Um, no surprises. I've kind of had this theme all throughout our presentation thus far. You know, if you get a right to know request, if an agency gets a right to know request, and it's not quite clear. On, or maybe there's some special circumstances. There's absolutely nothing in the right to know request in the right to know law that prevents you from picking up the phone or sending an email to the requester. Say, hey, I'm not sure about what you're asking for. Do you mind clarifying? Or are you actually asking for this particular record? OK, because, you know, we want to give you what you're asking for or the requester when they submit the request. They can say something like, look, if if it's going to cost more than ten dollars, contact me first before you do anything else. OK, because I want to make sure we're on the same page and I'm paying for what you know, I'm getting what I'm paying for. OK, can the requester ask to use the agency copier and be charged for it at the agency's discretion? Well, they can ask, but it's up to the agency to determine um, whether or not you're going to allow them to use your copier. And if you choose to charge them a fee for the copies, that's that's acceptable. Just remember, you can't charge them more than 25 cents a page. OK, you can do that. Um, OK, other other points that I want to make with this slide. Yeah, if if you receive a right to know request and you do a quick calculation and it looks like it's going to exceed a hundred dollars, you can ask for payment before you begin processing the request. OK, you can uh, I view it as kind of a security deposit where you can say it appears your request, your response is going to exceed $100 in costs. Send us a check for the estimated full amount. That way, the law guarantees the agency does not get stiffed for payment before they begin work on the response. OK, and I should clarify, we talked about the deadlines. These are the deadlines for the response to a right to know request. These are not the deadlines for actual providing the records. If you look at the right to know request, there are no deadlines for the provision of records. It's simply considered a reasonable period of time. So within the five business days, you provide an initial response that says we are granting your request or we're denying your request or we're taking the extension. At the end of the 30 calendar days, same exercise. We are granting your request or we're denying your request. And then you can say, send us a check for the amount. And then once the check clears, we'll provide you with the records. OK, and there's no deadline related to the provision of the records. 
it's just considered to be a you know somewhat subjective, but a reasonable period of time, a couple of days. All right. And then we'll mail the records to you or however you arrange for that exchange. The deadlines are related to the response, not the provision of records. OK, which brings us to this next point, record discard. If you make arrangements with somebody, you granted their request, you said, OK, it's going to cost 30 bucks. Uh, the person says, all right, I'll come down to the office and I'll pay for them and pick them up at that point. Um, but then they never show. Well, it's 60 days. After 60 calendar days, if they don't show, you can discard the records because you did everything you're supposed to do. All right. It's not your fault that they can't show up in two months to pick up the records. But if there was a cost related to that request, that does not go away. If they owe you $30, even though legally you were allowed to dispose of the records, they still owe you the $30. OK, and there's no statute of limitations on that. It doesn't go away after a month, doesn't go away after a year, doesn't go away after 10 years. And if there is an outstanding fee, you can deny any subsequent right to know requests from that requester. OK, now understand, though, if you deny a request, denials can be appealed. OK, so you want to make sure all your I's are dotted and your T's are crossed, because if they appeal, the appeals officer is going to ask to see all communication you had with the requester, how you calculated the fees, et cetera, et cetera. Usually, if everything is in order, you'll find that the appeals officer agrees with the agency. Yes, there was an outstanding debt, okay? And uh, the person, the denial was appropriate, okay? So let me come up here. We've had some questions come in. It's down here. Bear with me. There we go. OK, a requester asks for documents that are public records of the oh my gosh of the prothonotary's office and a fee is required. However, the fees didn't add up to one hundred dollars. Are we prohibited to ask for lower dollar amounts ahead? Um, if it's before you provide a response, yes. OK. Um, If you provided a response, if you said we are granting access to these records and it's going to cost, let's say, $30, then you can say, send us the check for $30. And when your check clears, we'll provide the records. OK, the $100, you can actually ask, you can actually demand that before you provide a response because you did a quick estimate and you realize the response is going to be significant. OK, it's going to exceed $100. So you ask for the security deposit. All right. But if it's less than $100, you have to provide the grant before you can ask for the money. You know, you can say we're granting your request. It's going to cost you $30. Send us the check. OK, you see how the logic is there. OK, now next one, if we destroy records, can they say they want the records before they pay a month or a year later? Oh, I think I understand. OK, uh, tell me if I'm correct here where you get a right to know request. Someone says they want the meeting records. OK, they want them for the last three months. And I'm going to be requesting them from here on out. <clears throat> so um, just send me the meeting minutes from now on. OK, well, if that's the case, you cannot prospectively ask for records because the records currently do not exist. OK, you don't have them in your possession because the records haven't been created yet. Now, if I misunderstand that, given what you're given what Walt is saying here. If the records have been destroyed, well, again, you no longer have the records in your possession. So um, they don't no longer exist. OK, and if you destroyed them, 
through a legitimate records retention program, uh, then you're fine. OK, then. But if you destroyed them in response to receiving the request, yeah, then then you've got bigger problems than your right to know request. Um, but, you know, if the if the records were destroyed for legitimate reasons, then they no longer are in the agency's possession. And if they're, you're not in the possession, well, then you can't provide them. OK. If after 60 days, I'm not, OK, hold on here. After 60 days of non-payment and you're requiring the payment, can they say, I won't pay till I get my request filled? Well, then that, that constitutes an outstanding debt. So you can deny any further right to know requests from that person because there is an outstanding debt. Again, the agency did everything it was legally required to do. It's not the agency's fault that the person can't show up within two months to pay for the records they requested. Well, now I will pay for them because I want to put in another right to know request. Again, if the records were destroyed, they have to put in a second right to know request for the same records and they have to pay for them again, a second, you know, $30. All right, that makes sense? I think so. <laughs> OK. All right. Good. OK. All right, moving on here. I told you we were going to go over an hour. All right, let me get back to the screen slide here and move on. Yeah, let's say that you're denying access to the requested records. You should put a denial letter together and you should follow this format. First, you put in a description of the records that were requested. You're thinking, well, that seems rather obvious, but you know, you get these requests that are written by people who they're not attorneys, but they play attorneys on TV. Maybe it's not exactly clear what they're asking for. So put it in your own words. We think you're asking for these records, okay? Then you make the legal case why you're denying. Remember, you bear the burden. So this is where the rubber hits the road. Um, these records are protected by, let's say, Section 708B-17, okay, non-criminal investigation. Uh, therefore, we are invoking, you know, Section 708B-17 of the Right to Know Law. Then you put down the contact information for the arrow. Remember, this is the person legally required to receive, uh, um, process and respond to the right to know request. So you need to put that information on there. The date of the response, and this is important because now another deadline has kicked in for the person to file an appeal. And then the procedure for filing the appeal. Usually it's they have 15 business days to file an appeal with the Office of Open Records. Okay, um, so let's talk about that real quick. 15 business days, it's the Office of Open Records business days, okay? And we are a Monday through Friday uh, operation. We follow, we're an independent agency, but we do follow the state's holiday calendar, okay? So that usually applies. Um, now, when we receive an appeal here at the office, uh, typically it comes into the website. We look for four elements, um, a copy of the original request, a copy of the agency's response, provided they gave one. Uh, then there's a statement about why they believe the records are public and why they believe the agency is wrong. OK, if any of these elements are missing, we issue what's called a deficiency order. We give them uh, like two days to correct the deficiency. If they do that, the case gets docketed. If not, we dismiss the case. We kick it out. OK, but if it gets docketed, then we send out a notification to the agency and to the person filing the appeal. Uh, it's known as a docketing package. And the case gets docketed means it's assigned a four, you know, a digit code. It's usually it's 2023 dash uh, four digit code. It gets assigned to an appeals officer and then this notice goes out. Now, if you are here today from an agency, this is probably the most important thing you will hear me say. If you receive 
one of these docketing packages, run, do not walk to your solicitor and let them know immediately that you have a right to no appeal. Folks, everything I have discussed up to this point is what I will describe as an administrative process. The other side of the Office of Open Records is that we are defined as an independent quasi-judicial tribunal, which means we are a court, okay? Your solicitor will know and work within very tight deadlines on how to respond to a right to know appeal. Don't try to respond to these on your own because the courts require that we use certain language, certain formats, et cetera, et cetera, certain legal principles in order to process these right to know appeals. So we need to require it of you. Nothing is more upsetting than having to rule against an agency based on a procedural error because an arrow tried to respond to an appeal rather than having the solicitor do it and following the appropriate legal procedures. Like, you know, an arrow may simply respond back and say, we don't have this record. Unfortunately, that doesn't meet the legal burden that's required during the appeal process. So please, 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 please immediately contact your solicitor so that they can begin the appropriate steps to respond to the appeal and represent the agency appropriately. Okay, it's very important. Okay, but when we are, are there any consequences through the if all public requests are denied and then only answered after an appeal is filed? Uh, yeah, yeah. There's um, there's actually some case law on that. You want to look at the city of Reading, um, most recently versus I think it was a union down there. It was like the Electrical Workers Union where. Uh, the city of Reading denied, uh, well, they just ignored 10 um, right to no requests, and then they were appealed, and they ignored them here at the Office of Open Records, and then they took them to court, and the court ruled against the city of Reading, and they attached sanctions. There, there was uh, uh, some monetary uh, uh, sanctions that the city of Reading then had to pay. Okay, now I think it was the city of Reading. It may have been Berks County, but it was one of those two, uh, thinking back. Okay, so yeah, th there, there can be some consequences. All right, um, the product of an appeal is a final determination. Okay, this is the ruling coming out of our office. These are legally binding orders. Okay, they carry the weight of law. They're typically issued within 30 days of receiving the appeal. And there, the rulings are available on our website uh, and on the legal services like Lexis and Westlaw. We have a database of all these final determinations. It's like 30,000 and counting. You can go in and search. You can search on municipality. You can search on your name. You can put in a random text string like fees and go in and it, all the uh, final determinations related to, you know, uh, whatever you're searching on will come up. OK, uh, if we receive a request via email, can I send the requester the URL for the request form and ask them to submit the email address? Uh, yeah, I think that's reasonable. If that's a practice that your agency has, then, yeah, you can ask them to follow the appropriate procedure uh, for filing a right to know request that you've adopted. I, I think that covers what you're asking for. OK, so. The final determinations. Um, one of the, one of the options during the appeal process is mediation. Okay, sometimes you just get the feel that if the parties actually talk to each other, they could work it out, and that's what we do. Uh, we have trained mediators, where if the agency agrees to mediation, if the requester agrees to mediation, the case gets taken out of the normal queue and gets assigned to a mediator, and they just get the parties talking to each other. It could be as simple as a conference call. And if they're able to agree, then problem solved. If they're not able to agree, well, then we return the case back to the normal process. 
but it's an option that's available. It's reasonably successful. You might want to consider it if you're involved with the appeal process. OK, and then our cases carry the weight of law, which means they can be appealed. So if the original request was dealing with an agency, a local agency, it goes to the County Court of Common Pleas within 30 days. If it deals with a state agency, it goes to the Pennsylvania Commonwealth Court within 30 days. The Office of Open Records is not a party to the dispute. The dispute still remains between the requester and the agency, okay? We're simply a lower level court and you're appealing our ruling, okay? And, and you take the dispute there, but you have to notify us if you do appeal to a higher level court because we'll monitor the case. We may submit uh, briefs as friends of the court, or we may ask to appear before the court if it's an important issue of law, okay? But we are not a party to the actual dispute. Okay, and then this brings us to the end of the presentation. If you have any further questions, now's the time to get them in, okay? But I want to, in the meantime, just bring your attention to this website I've been talking about throughout the presentation. The Office of Open Records, the URL is on the screen right now. If you've ever sat through one of my other webinars, you know what I'm about to say. This is the best government website that you will ever see. It gets updated six days a week with new information. Any rulings that our office has issued, any court cases that have come out and have been documented, uh, any, any training that is currently going on, uh, anything related to the Pennsylvania Sunshine Act, which deals with uh, the open meetings law, okay? We have a page on our website specifically dedicated to everything related to, you know, right to know law, uh, Sunshine Act, other government transparency issues. If you are a real geek about government openness, consider subscribing to our Twitter feed. And every morning at 7 a.m., we will wake you up with all the news that's fit to print for the day about government transparency, not just in Pennsylvania, but throughout the country, okay? Um, excellent resource. And a lot of it is based on your input with you telling us what you want to know, okay? Now, I think we are at the end of the presentation. No more questions. I want to thank you for your participation today. You've been what we call a hot bench. You know, if you've got, uh, if, if you've got a, a court that's asking a lot of questions, they're called a hot bench, and that's you guys today. Okay, hey, questions have popped up. Uh, can you please give again the section of the law that lists items for redaction other than the obvious? Okay, there is no section of the law. It's going to be based, Elizabeth, primarily on case law. Uh, and the original case law was... Oh, I think it was the Pennsylvania Education Association versus the Office of Open Records. I think that's how it's still docketed. That originally dealt with uh, the provision of home addresses for public school teachers. Now, since then, the application of the language in that decision has greatly expanded, but the court recognize that the Pennsylvania state constitution has what's called a, a right to privacy clause. And in that is included, well, first offhand, social security numbers are protected by federal statute. Okay, police information, again, there's the other law called CREA. But in general, one of the things you want to take a look at is the right to privacy afforded by the Pennsylvania State Constitution, which our office has said, like any home address, okay, that that isn't considered um, public information, you can withhold, okay? And some of this is subjective, like dates of birth, et cetera, et cetera, okay? But in general, you would refer to case law and then you want to take a, take a look at other laws that um, uh, would, would provide confidentiality provisions for information that you may come in contact. 
Okay, and sometimes you just have to go with your gut feeling and do some research that, yeah, social security numbers are confidential, that kind of stuff. Okay, if you're wrong, we'll tell you when when the appeal gets filed. But, you know, I don't know of any open records officers that have, that have ever gone to jail yet. Okay, Walt, have you considered switching from Twitter to another platform? Feeds aren't always public anymore without signing into an account. Uh, actually, no, Walt, we haven't thought of that. But, you know, if you want to shoot us an email with other platforms that we should take a look at, we will. Okay, um, we really haven't revised our social media policy and practices for a couple of years. So I'm not aware of other platforms, but I'm an old guy, so I don't really stay on top of that. Uh, but if there are other ones that you think would be a benefit, yeah, let us know. And uh, we'll take a look at that. Thank you. Okay, Alyssa, your check will be in the mail. You're welcome. Okay, am I familiar with this? Well, Elizabeth, I'm not sure. If you're talking about the right to know law, the answer is yes. Uh, oh, okay, here. Someone jumped in between, okay, section 708B6. All phone numbers, wife names, bank check routing, and account numbers and bank references itself should be redacted. Well, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, you're asking about 708B6. Okay, it's always on a case by case basis, but if you're asking in general, um, personal phone numbers, personal email addresses, um, bank check routing, and OK, now there is a hiccup in the law regarding bank information where it's not included in the right to know law, but everyone agrees that it should be. So if you redact bank account information, you'll probably be OK. Uh, I'm going to say that with most of this, you want to take a common sense approach. Like my wife's name, okay? Now, there's a very good chance that if you Google it, you'll find out my wife's name. But through the right to know process, again, I think that constitutional right to privacy uh, applies here, where there is no sound business case for an agency to provide my wife's name, whether I'm an employee or a resident of the municipality or whatever. Now, there's a very good chance you can find that out anyway through, like I said, uh, uh, an internet search. But the agency should probably play it safe and not release that information if it, it deems it confidential, okay? Um, this may involve one of those deals where we take the conversation offline and feel free to contact our office. Okay, Walt, threads from Meta or Facebook. Um, we'll take a look at it. We don't have a Facebook presence, uh, but Meta, we might take a look at given the way social media is kind of evolving these days. But thanks, thanks for the suggestion. Okay, I'm just a bit confused regarding must and should. I want to make sure that I am doing what I should. Okay, yeah. Um, Elizabeth, this comes up, and, and my mistake if I use one of these words out of school, but you want to take a look at what our office says and what the law says. If it says should, that means you have discretion. If it says shall, that means you don't. Okay, so if the law says the agency shall do this, that means you better do it. If the law says the agency should do this, that means, yeah, you you. You know, you might want to take a look and do this if you want to, but we're not saying you shall do it. OK, if a requester says they want all the records requested by another requester, is that a legitimate request? Actually, it is. Right to no requests are considered public records. OK. But when you provide a copy of the actual right to no request, you can redact the home addresses for the person who requested the original and back and forth. Yeah, I hate it when this happens, what you're describing, but it does. But the bottom line is that right to no requests and the responses are considered public records. Yeah, I I'm familiar with Meta. I'm just not 
really familiar with Meta. Okay, yeah, good. Thank you for these suggestions. That's okay, that's okay. Um, okay, I think we're at the end here. And again, I, wa I wanna thank everybody for your participation today. You know, and I really don't mind the questions. They were all great questions and uh, it keeps me on my toes. So it, it knows that uh, I'm not putting you guys to sleep. So good crowd today. Uh, we'll be back in two weeks with our next webinar. Hope to see you all there. In the meantime, uh, stay cool and uh, enjoy this nice weather. And uh, yeah, see you next time. We're signing off. Bye-bye.